Now, what has been the effect of the book itself? I mean, that you put this together, now you've collected the story, the history, mm -hmm. uh, the perspective, and then it takes on a life of its own after that. It does. Talk to us a little bit about how that's worked. It's been an, it was, it's turned into an experience that I hadn't anticipated. I had interviewed people back in the late 80s when I was at undergraduate school. And I had always wanted to write this book. Um, my first book actually was on the history of Cornwall and Messina, which were two major headquarters during the, the project. But there was just something about these two interviews. Um, one was a janitor um, at SUNY Potsdam. Another one was a, a mechanic. And the way that they told me about their stories, about a friend that they had lost in a fire um, on the project, and, and what the project still meant to them several decades later. Initially, I thought the book was going to be a memorial to them. And mm. it, it drove me to do this. Um, my father had, had grown up doing this type of work and was always in danger. So I thought, this is a good way to pay tribute um, to the people who built this project and sacrificed, some sacrificed their lives. But then when I spoke at the 50th in 2009 and the book had come out, I realized that it had another purpose, not only um, for the gentleman that I had written it for, but also for the various authorities that were trying to repair the seaway. They saw this as a way of introducing a new generation of um, the public as well as politicians about the importance historically and to the future um, of the project, and also to show the weaknesses of it, um, not only during construction, but that need to be repaired now. So instead of being just a memorial, instead of being a, a project that just for me was something that I wanted to do, it's, it's turned into a different type of vehicle for a lot of people. And, and so, who are some of those people? How does this work? I mean, mm -hmm. when you refer to the 50th, you're yes. talking about the anniversary, the mm -hmm. 50th anniversary of the opening of the Seaway. Yes, it was different than the power dam, which was the year before. So, and it's a timeliness factor, too. I mean, history mm -hmm. got, it changes, it eclipses certain things. Sure. Um, you're always getting ready to fight the last war to repair the last leak. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the book has, has reopened not only the past, but I think the future in a way. Mm -hmm. How is it? How are you becoming more and more aware of that? Well, I think I'm becoming aware of the fact that the people who maintain uh, the current facilities, whether it be the dam or, or uh, dredging projects, or even the media people on both sides, um, at Hydro One as it's called now, at the New York Power Authority, at the Coast Guard, they're learning things about the facilities that they are maintaining and utilizing. They're also being able to use the material that I've gathered um, to uh, bring attention to the Seaway, um, you know, the director of the Seaway, as well as to, to senators and other people. Um, this is how important this project was then. It has a importance in the future. We can't lose this transportation route. We can't always count on the fact that we're going to be able to import things. We're, we're going to possibly have to start exporting things. And the power component of it will always be one of the cheapest and most efficient ways to supply power to New York City and, and other places. So that's the people who are using it are using it in, in a manner to sort of say, this is how it was built. This is what it was meant for. Um, now let's, let's learn from this um, and, and, and use it. Do you, do you think the power aspect of it in, in terms of an energy policy, which our mm. Congress is sooner or later going to have to deal with, yes. is, is an example of what can be done? Sure. I was standing next to the head of the New York Power Authority. I didn't know who he was. It's the 50th, and we were standing at the, the visitor center looking out over this expansive power dam, and he said, gosh, we should have built five of these when we could. He said, this is the most efficient, this is the cheapest power production we have in New York State. He said, now we can't do it because of environmental reasons. He said, but we really could, we could use um, more facilities like this and not only to supply power, but of course to do it um, within a certain budget. But it was funny, he was young, he was my age, and it was funny to hear him say something like that. Yeah, because the, uh, and, and, and this is what you find out <laughs> yeah. with, with history, is that you, you look at stuff and you go, wow, how did they do that? Yeah. It was like the Empire mm -hmm. State Building and all these things that people did, mm -hmm. uh, and it always comes down to the budget. We couldn't do that now. 
I mean, yeah. now there's projects that go on that the budget goes up in six sure. months. I mean, this was a billion back then. I, I can't even hazard a guess yeah. based on the concrete and the dredging and the equipment, the design, um, the number would be impossible to recreate. The question is, what can they do now to continue to have it be a viable system? They're doing it with the Panama Canal. Can we do similar things with, with the Seaway? And can they turn it back into um, not only the transportation, but the marketing tool that they had always envisioned it being? It, it, can it be an engine for you know economic sure. uh, uh, growth in the Midwest? Or even in the, or, in the North, which is what it was supposed to be. Yeah, not to, in the North of? Of New York State, they expected. I mean, Alcoa uh, got power from There's it. Nothing Reynolds, going on up there. General, they all closed. Is dead. Yeah. yeah, they all closed. But the idea was that they were all going to have ports. That manufacturing, because of the cheap labor that was up there, um, the ability to transport things very inexpensively, that this was going to rebuild that area. If they had done it before the '50s, probably, because those that was the center of manufacturing in the U.S. and Canada. That's a very interesting perspective. And I, you know, it, it, it always amazes me how things just go into the past and we forget them. Yeah, yeah. I know. It was a very prosperous area. Cornwall, major paper manufacturing, textile manufacturing, um, Alcoa, aluminum processing plant, largest one they had was in Messina because of their access to the waterway. And it, it was a time, we had about probably a three decade time period there when they really started actively talking about the seaway and the, the power f facility and it would have completely changed um, that area. They had even proposed a, a aerial highway that would have connected 81 to Messina right after um, that, the construction and would have brought in more manufacturing. But so part matter. of this is political too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the decision to spend sure. money somewhere else or to, uh, you know, uh, ship things overseas because it's cheaper sure. to produce. All that plays into this. It did. It was the. It was a great project. It was. It was a monumental uh, construction feat. Bad timing. Bad timing <laughs> is the best uh, way to put it. How do we figure this out? <laughs> yeah. well, uh, the timing, uh, the timing issue is something too that you have to handle in writing a book like this. I, mm -hmm. By the time you start, by the t when you start, and by the time you finish, things have changed too, right? Sure, they did. How did you handle that? I mean, you knew you were working on, on a moving mm -hmm. target. I, I did. How, how do you how do you compensate? Well, I think I had to deal with um, sort of the natural things that happen in life. A lot of the people that I wanted to interview uh, would pass away within days of me talking to them and trying to set up an interview. To, yeah. Yeah. And also, I think I had to deal with um, casting aside what a lot of historians go into a project with. I had to cast aside my ideas, really, about what this book was going to do. It took on a mind of its own somewhat. I could outline general themes or general chapters, but once I started interviewing these gentlemen and women, I really had questions that I wanted them to answer, but I let them go with it. And that's where the book took on a life of its own and I think took on more meaning, that I was able to listen to them and let them tell their stories, and in that way, um, I was able to shape um, my book differently, possibly, than I would have starting out.